bonds held by insurance companies, big banks, and pension funds are coming unwound. They are not just declining, they are in free fall. Why? Because of losses in equities and bonds being leveraged to make up for those losses. Institutions are using leverage and derivative products to try to achieve higher and higher rates of return, and the returns are not there. There is pretty much nothing to invest in. Most everything is in decline, even the assets that have been considered uh, safe havens in the past. The charade is starting to be exposed, where debt and leverage don't work anymore, at least not in this environment. Hi, I am Ben Repond. Today is October 11, 2022. Welcome to my YouTube broadcast. Corporate and government bonds are going through a 100-year storm, or maybe it's a 500-year storm. This disconnect is wreaking havoc among buy and hold traditional investment and retirement portfolios used by traditional type financial advisors. And it appears that the damage is not done. This is not supposed to happen like this, but it is. This scenario has not been studied by traditional type financial advisors. They don't have an answer for it and do not know what to do. The most common phrase that I am told by people who call me is that these financial advisors are telling their clients just to stay put and do nothing. Really? Are you kidding me? Do nothing and watch things collapse in free fall? That makes no sense to me. I'm going to play a few clips. Uh, we're going to spend time on bonds, which means debt, and uh, what's going on. Because as I said, bonds, bond funds, bond ETFs are in free fall. They have been falling for about two years now. Since the summer of 2020, most bonds, certainly government bonds, have been falling and falling and falling. The, uh, but I'll, I want to play these. Uh, just th This is from, the first one is from David McIlvaney uh, from his podcast this past week, uh, the three brief clips where he talks about the issues that are in uh, the UK. The UK really faced a, this last week, a bond uh, crisis, and um, it, it certainly is having a lot of difficulty. So he's, he talks about that mostly from the Europe and UK standpoint, but I want us not to think of, oh, that's them, and we're immune from that, because we are very interconnected with both the UK and with Europe. So if they have a problem, we are going to have a problem if we don't already. The only thing saving the U.S. right now uh, is not the issue of debt and leverage because that's, uh, that's in trouble everywhere. The only thing saving us is the strength of the dollar against the other currencies. But otherwise, we're in the same boat that they are. In Europe, inflation is raging, and he talks about that. They have a serious energy crisis brought on by the Russia-Ukraine war and the, the, the agreements, the contracts that they have had with Russia that are in jeopardy for this coming uh, season. They have borrowed, just recently, borrowed $200 billion of, or excuse me, 200 billion euros to help pay for energy this winter. Germany borrowed 200 billion. They borrowed it, but it's just debt on their balance sheet. They have no plan, just like us, they have no plans to pay it back. They have no plans to pay the interest on it. Just create, borrow a couple of hundred billion, issue bonds, 
and uh, interest rates are already above 10%, as he points out, uh, which is showing up in the bond rates. This is a setup for a collapse, a complete collapse in bonds, and it will spread. But anyway, the first clip is him talking about this. We've got inflation still raging. Look at Germany. Uh, it'll focus your attention. Now, the German CPI exceeded expectations in September, coming in at over 10%, as did the broader European numbers, also north of 10%, double digit for both. Germany is now committed to 200 billion euros in government borrowing to defray the consumer costs of energy bills in the months ahead. 200 billion is a big number. That figure is far more significant from a fiscal standpoint if you're comparing the 200 billion to the two to three billion in tax savings, which had been proposed by the English Chancellor of the Exchequer last week. Again, it was a tax break for the rich, 40% tax rate instead of 45, and it would have saved them two to three billion in taxes. The Germans are spending an extra 200 billion, and that doesn't seem to rile the markets as much as this. Uh, <laughs> injustice, so to say. Nevertheless, you've got inflation raging higher on the continent as energy costs in Europe remain really in Putin's grasp. The second piece, he talks about debt and leverage. Debt and then the leverage using derivatives uh, puts all asset classes in the system at risk. The whole system is built on it's just a, it's a house of cards. And so uh, it, obviously I can say that, but it's, you know it. I mean, the, the, when you can borrow money and print money at will with nothing behind it, no intention of paying it back, you know that um, the system's in trouble. It's just a question of when and how. Here's the second clip. It probably comes as no surprise to hear me say that with massive quantities of debt in the financial markets and assets which have been geared or leveraged for exceptional returns using various tools, again, to leverage up those trades that we have these frailties emerging in Europe. And so Larry Summers commented that global market risk is building like it was in August of 2007. Mm. He went on to say crisis firefighters had better not book vacations. And then finally, leverage and derivatives exacerbate losses in a down market. This is not planned on. This is actually what happened in 2008 with Lehman Brothers is, and with Bear Stearns is that they had so much leverage, they thought real estate can't go down that much because they had hedged it and they thought they were protected. What they didn't count on was a system-wide meltdown where there was a, a crisis in liquidity. And that's what's at stake right now. Pension portfolios, as Michael Bainey points out, pension portfolios have been leveraged seven times, seven times their value. So you've got these derivative products that are trying to magnify the gains and they're turning into losses. And a lot of that is done with bonds margin calls are starting to happen. And now there are margin calls on top of margin calls. Again, just like in 2008, running into a crisis of liquidity. This is stressing the markets and further pushing down bond and stock prices. McElvaney explains. By now, last week's bout of volatility, if you're looking back at the news through the weekend, you get it. Um, <laughs> We had the required central bank interventions. Everyone, I think, understands what happened. Fixed income assets. These were bonds within pension portfolios, which were leveraged as much as seven they times. Were crushed. Had their value crushed by a rapid rise in rates. So not only did the fixed income portfolio suffer, but it was a leveraged fixed income portfolio. That triggered margin calls. The forced liquidation of collateral, which included similar bonds, recycled and magnified the issue as collateral was liquidated, interest rates rose even more, prices declined in lockstep, and more margin calls were triggered. So that sort of liquidation doom loop, as we've called it internally, was in effect last week. That pricing dynamic was reminiscent of the 1987 liquidation cycle perpetuated by portfolio insurance. 
And that was the name given to the structured derivative products meant to protect a portfolio from loss back in the 80s. But under stress, ended up being a multiplier of losses to the tune of 22% in one day. So the Bank of England intervened to prevent another Lehman moment. And that was last week. Bloomberg reports $1.7 trillion in UK pension strategies hedged dynamically in this way. It's not a small number. No. Bond losses are everywhere. This is a picture of a chart through last Friday. You can see that bond, this is the 20 year long term government bond. But if I didn't show you this chart and I showed you the intermediate term bond or the short term bond or the corporate bond, the high yield bond, whatever, they're all doing the same thing. They're all falling a lot. And this is creating a lot of stress on portfolios. So this TLT, a long term government bond, if you go back to the summer of 2020, and this gets us, so this will put us at about 27 months from the beginning, not on this chart, but in concept. This ETF is down, today is down 42% from the summer of 2020. 42%. This and things like it, um, you know, intermediate term, short term, corporate bonds, whatever, all these bonds, are in portfolios to protect risk. This one in particular, down 42% from its high a couple of years ago. And this is not just to point out what's going on with bonds, it's to point out what's going on with investment and retirement portfolios. They are having, I hate to use the word collapsing, but they are in a continual state of decline day after day, week after week, month after month, going down, down, and down. And no one knows where the bottom is. And this is causing investors a lot of uh, stress and uh, they don't know what to do about it. The financial advisors try to put a, a happy face on it and say, you know, stay in your seat, it's gonna go back up. They don't know, they have no clue. They, they didn't even see this coming. How do they know what's gonna happen in the future? They don't know but they have to say that to calm people down because people are seeing that the financial advisor industry has failed them. They have not protected, they have not invested in assets or changed the direction of assets uh, in a way that has protected the investors. And I, I ask the question, why in the heck are you paying somebody a fee to lose that much of your money? Think about it. The, Next clip I want to show came on actually this morning, uh, and it's an interview that Joe Kernan and Becky Quick did with Muhammad El Arian. I like uh, El Arian because he um, he is very independent and he is incredibly smart. He knows the markets quite well. That's why they have him on so much. And but he doesn't. He's not a perma bear. And he's not just a negative person. When, when things are going well, he's more than uh, willing to talk about how well things are going. So uh, he's very balanced. And uh, I always find him to be correct in what he says. Um, he talks about how broken the system is and how the Fed has painted themselves into the corner. They have no alternative but to keep hiking interest rates, even if the system breaks. And when Joe Kernan pressed him on that point, he, you mean, or you think that's what's gonna happen? Are you okay with that? And he says, we don't have an option. That has to happen, or I'm gonna be back here and we'll have a different conversation. But he says, it's, that's the problem, is they, the Fed has done it wrong They've done it wrong in the uh, what they start when they started and the amount of hikes that they've um, applied. So, and again, he points this out. Here's Dr. Elarian. Some economists fear that the Fed, humbled by staying too long and saying trend store, is now staying too long in terms of, of raising, and we don't know yet. We haven't had an earnings 
season. We don't know how it's really affecting things. We, they may break something. Uh, we may already be in a sharp slowdown. Maybe they stay at this party too long, the tightening party. You don't think so? So there's two elements to this. Can they stop? Can they pivot? No, they cannot. They cannot because the data doesn't give them enough of a green light. But importantly, that credibility has been hit really hard. Will they end up overdoing it? Most likely, yes. So they've gotten themselves into this hole. And unfortunately, they don't know how to get out of this hole. There's no ladder out of this hole. People have to realize there's no ladder out of this hole. Should we say, gee, you guys, your credibility was damaged. Now you've got to regain your credibility. Is that good for us and for the country that they have credibility? Or are we paying for their mistake with a recession that, that we really, you know, I don't feel like paying for their mistake with a recession just so they can re regain credibility. Well, first of all, you, you have no choice but to pay for their mistakes. And that's one of the tragedies of the situation. Yes, we're all going to pay for their mistakes. And some, of, some people are already paying. There was another concern that you brought up, Becky, this morning with Roger, which is it's not just about inflation, recession. It's also about financial stability. That's the third leg of this thing. So yes, Joe, I don't know how we can avoid paying for this mistake because they have been late. They mischaracterized inflation as transitory. When they finally recognized their mistake, they didn't act. Remember, in the middle of March, when we printed the February inflation print over 7%, they were still injecting liquidity into this economy. That's last March. Mohammed, wait a second. When you say the third part of the equation, the financial stability, do you think there is the risk that things will be broken in the markets if they raise another 75 basis points? This is the most front-loaded interest rate hiking cycle we've had for decades. We're coming from zero interest rates. The whole system got conditioned to believe that zero interest rates was forever, that injections of liquidity were predictable, and now we're adjusting. The UK has given us a warning sign. But there are people in the market who still haven't taken the Fed seriously, so they have not gotten to themselves to a place where they're not going to have massive issues if the Fed doesn't slow down? So we have, first of all, this is the non-banks, not the banks. So yeah. that's the good news, because the banks are in the middle of the payments and settlement system. The non-banks are not. So that's, that's good news. Yes, there are certain. Um, you can start with the zombie companies who are finding it much harder to refinance. And if they can get refinancing, the cost of this refinancing makes their numbers look completely different. Mm -hmm. Then you can go to various investors who over levered, that that's going to be an issue. So yeah, I, I'm, I, we have to keep an eye on the third element, which, which is financial stability. It's not just about inflation and growth. It's also about financial stability. That, that's almost. We invest our clients' money. We have several different strategies. I'm going to show you a couple of them. I haven't reported on this for a while, but I'm, uh, this is the end of the third quarter, so I thought it would be a good point uh, to just show you what we are doing performance-wise with our clients' money. These are taken from our fact sheets, which are taken from live accounts and are published on our, um, on our website. So you can access them there if you want to see them. And we, we update them actually monthly. I'm going to show two portfolios. One is our, our strategy, one is our moderate strategy, and the other is our high performance. And this shows um, that we have had a gain for the last three months of 3.6%. We have had a loss year to date of 10.15%. This compares to most portfolios that are strategies that are down about 25%. And over the last 12 months, we are down 4.81%. Since inception, we're up 12.9%. And this is net after our fee. The high performance strategy has a three month rate of return of 6.62. Year to date, down 11%. A 12 month rate of return almost break even, down about a third of a percent, and a, uh, since inception, a 25% rate of return. Uh, next, I want to give you the flow of funds report. This is where money is going. Uh, no surprise, uh, with a high degree of volatility, um, a market in turmoil um, <laughs> this past week, but this, this year, actually. No surprise that there have been outflows going out of equity funds and out of bond funds. And you see that because of the decline in equity funds and bond funds. Uh, 
Equity funds had net outflows of 15.7 billion. Conventional bond funds had outflows of 17.4 billion. Both of those are almost double the previous week. And money market funds had outflows of 12.1 billion. Where is the money going? If it's not going into bonds and stocks and money market, where is it going? Well, I don't know. Um, that would be a lot of money to just hold in physical cash. But I'll just leave that as an open question. All I can say is money is going somewhere because there is a fleeing away from risk assets. I just can't explain the money market part of it. Now I'll give you the dashboards. This looks like the previous week. It looks almost identical. Through Friday of this past week, these are the exchange traded funds, the indexes that I track, the Dow Industrials, in kind of declining order, uh, DIA, Dow Industrials, SPY, S&P 500, IWM, Russell 2000, EEM, uh, Emerging Markets, EFA, um, Developed Markets, TLT, the Long-Term Government Bond, which I just showed you the picture of, and QQQ, the NASDAQ 100. And when you look at the five sets of numbers going across the center of the page, the right set of numbers going down the page gives you the rate of return of each of those ETFs and those indexes that they track um, for uh, through uh, Friday from the beginning of the year, year to date. The sets of red dots on the right show you where those indexes are, those ETFs, are relative to their moving averages, the 20, 50, 100, and 200 day moving averages. So you can see, this kind of gives you a really good snapshot of the stock market, that the Dow is down 19% year to date. S&P 500 down 20%. This is through Friday. Uh, Russell 2000 uh, small cap index down 24%. Emerging markets down 27. Developed markets down 27. Long-term government bond down 31%. And down 42% from summer of 2020. And the NASDAQ 100 down 32%. A component of the NASDAQ 100 is the semiconductors. And those are down this year 42%. The S&P 500 is comprised of 11 sectors. This is a dashboard showing you the rates of return of each of these sectors for the week, month, quarter, and year to date, and then where they are relative to those same moving averages. It stands out, obviously, that energy, the ETF XLE, part of the you know, a sector in the S&P 500, is above all four moving averages. All other sectors are below all four moving averages. It's an interesting tale of two stories. Um, the energy, which is oil companies and oil, oil has had uh, inter, um, oil has had a spike up in the past week or so, so it is up 47 percent year to date, and it, again is ahead of all four of these moving averages. But then, as you go down, losses are 12, 13, 19, 20, 23, etc., all the way down to the bottom, which is retail and telecommunication both down 35%. And as I said, uh, semiconductors, which is a subset of the technology index, is down 42%. Okay, I wanna move into the charts. So the first chart is the S&P 500, represented by the ETF SPY. This is a 12-month weekly chart. One move equals one week. 
and you can see the general direction. It goes up and down, but the general direction is down. And of course, as I showed on the dashboard that the um, ETF SPY, uh, the S&P 500, is below its 20 period moving average, which you can see here. Next is the growth component of the S&P 500 SPY, excuse me, SPY G. And this is a relative chart. And SPY-G is the numerator, SPY-V, the value component of the S&P 500, the value stocks divided into the growth stocks. And you can see the direction that this is going. So if it is going down, this is favoring value, value stocks. This is how out of favor the growth stocks are. They're both declining but the value stocks are declining less. At the beginning of the chart, you can see that uh, if you go back almost a year, you can see that the reverse was true. But this year has primarily been a period of uh, value stocks being in favor. The small cap index, IWM is the ETF, uh, is the numerator in this relative performance chart the denominator is SPY, so it's the relationship between small cap and large cap, large cap meaning the S&P 500. So I drew an arrow, the black arrow, showing the general direction which favors the large cap. Small cap, in the past few months, has started to become a little more in favor. And there is a trend I showed with a red arrow, the trend of small cap coming back into favor a little bit. Not to be confused, they are both in decline. But in the past several months, uh, small cap is starting to come decline less. I shouldn't say come back into favor, decline less than uh, large cap. And we've talked about before the uh, long-term government bond, TLT. This is a 30-month chart. And so you can see going back into 2020, which I, I mentioned that, it's down 42% from its high. The top of that first arrow on the left, all the way to the bottom of the arrow on the right, that difference is a 42% difference. And so, but it has gone down in two stages, but the direction, the intermediate term direction of long-term government bonds, as well as short-term and intermediate term, I'll show you those next, uh, is down. So just to show you the intermediate term bond, this is the chart of what it looks like. Now they're very similar, but there are differences. As you can see, IEF, the intermediate term bond in this 30 month picture is down more sharply in the, the second part and less sharply at the beginning, but they, it also is down a lot. And then finally, this shows a dramatic change. You can see the short term government bond is down very severely. Now this, I don't want to get into this too much, but this equates to the yield curve. The yield curve, that's inverted. The yield on the short-term treasuries is more elevated, way out of whack, way more elevated than the long-term. It's not supposed to be that way. And when that occurs, it's, it's an indication of a coming recession. We know that. The, and of course, bonds move inversely to yield. So because the short-term yields have been so high, it's causing the drop in that short-term bond to be exaggerated, and you can see it in this chart. Gold is a 48-month chart, so you can see over beyond two years that the general direction of gold measured by the ETF GLD is in a downward direction for over two years now. And then when we look at the 48 month chart on silver measured by SLV, same thing, but more dramatic because silver 
uh, moves up more sharply when it's moving up and you know down more sharply when it's moving down. Uh, but you can see at the end of the chart that there is a move, this has happened in the last two or three weeks, that there is a move for it to go, uh, go back up. Uh, we don't know if that's going to be sustained or not, but it's certainly the last couple of weeks have been uh, significant uh, growth, in, especially in silver. Then this is the comparison, silver being the numerator, gold being the denominator. So when it goes up, that's going to favor silver, and when it goes down, it's going to favor gold. So you can see, of course, it goes up and down a lot, but the general direction has been down. Both of them have been down, as we saw in the previous chart, but silver has been down more than gold, as evidenced by this, this relative performance chart. At the end of the chart, you can see the um, relationship of gold and silver, GLD, SOV, again, favoring silver at the very end. Um, we don't know yet if that's going to be sustained or not, but it's been uh, definitely silver in particular has come back into favor in the past couple of weeks. When the market goes down, the S&P 500 in particular goes down, that is measured by, a by the volatility index called the VIX, V-I-X. And I put it the, the line at 24, and if it is above 24, in my opinion, it's an indication of increased risk in the market. When it's dropping, risk is coming out of the market, and in particular, when it gets below 24, risk has come, you know, has tended to diminish out of the market. You can now see that, re uh, that the VIX, the volatility index, is um, above 31 as of Friday, and uh, quite a bit above 24. So it's showing the um, downward volatility of the market is becoming more pronounced. Asbury Research does um, uh, Asbury 6, which is a series of uh, six metrics measuring uh, different um, technical indicators in the market. All of those are negative and have been negative for a while. This is the uh, cross-asset relative performance, measuring the relationship of different asset classes or different assets. Uh, the beginning is stocks versus bonds. Both are down, bonds are down less. And not all bonds are down less. As I said, the government bonds are down more and the um, uh, high yield and even uh, some, many of the corporate bonds are down more. But the, the benchmark is AGG and it is technically down less, but they're both down. The uh, high beta versus low volatility, uh, high beta is uh, more in favor small cap versus a large cap. Small cap is in favor, as we saw from a previous chart. Uh, the S&P versus the Dow, the Dow is in favor. The Dow is more of a value-oriented uh, stocks, and uh, S&P is a mixture. So that's clearly going to favor uh, the Dow, as I indicated earlier. And the S&P 500 is clearly down less than the NASDAQ 100. And remember the value growth chart relative performance I showed you? Value is down less than growth. Emerging markets are outperforming the U.S. market. Government bonds are uh, down less than corporate bonds, high yield down less than high quality, and uh, short term down less than long term. U.S. versus the world. Now, these are just pure performance, uh, measuring SPY versus all of the ETFs for other countries. And you can look through here and see all of these countries, many of them uh, third world countries, are actually outperforming the U.S. Um, many reasons for that. You get back into the debt question, which gets into bonds, and uh, that's plaguing the U.S., but it's also plaguing other uh, developed countries. And uh, so it's um, showing that many of these, I'm not going to read the whole list, but you can see that there's a long list of 
countries that are outperforming the U.S. enough to get a green box, and the U.S. does not have one green box, as evidence from the issues that we've talked about earlier. Next, I want to show you the uh, data on the Buffett indicator. It indicates that the market is fairly valued as opposed to overvalued or undervalued, and that the ratio of um, the stock market divided by the GDP, the economy, that ratio is 153%. About a month ago, it was as high as 175%. At that point, it was overvalued. So, and this report is as of Friday of last week. Finally, the uh, gold and silver, uh, we've talked about this. Uh, they have been uh, moving up and gold is up 2.1%, up over 1,700 per ounce. And silver is up over $20, a gain of 6.5% from the previous week. Second consecutive week of strong gains in precious metals. Thank you for watching. If you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below, and uh, I will try to answer any questions you have. Thank you again for watching.